teaching. What a blessing to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Acts chapter 20. And we're going to be finishing uh, chapter 20 today, but we're going to be getting a running go starting in 29. I'm going to read that while you guys are finding your way there. It says, starting in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you every warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all and they all wept freely and they fell on Paul's neck and they kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more and they accompanied him to the ship. Father, thank you again for your word this morning. Once again, we ask that you would be our teacher by the Holy Spirit. And God, as we hear the heart of Paul pouring out for these young leaders, these young pastors that were there in the Ephesus region, uh, sharing the word of God and now having to carry it on without Paul, him knowing that his time had, 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 it was coming to a close through just jail sentences and all the trials he's gonna go through. Lord, again, he poured out his heart. And I pray that you would now, by your spirit, through the teaching of your word, pour out your heart on us as the future leaders and the current leaders of your church, that we would hear the passion of Paul, that we would understand, Lord, why he was pouring his heart out so diligently and passionately for them, and that you would minister to us in the same way, Lord, that we would be built up in the same way those early church leaders were that Paul was ministering to. And so we thank you and look forward to our time together, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, again, we finish uh, part three of an example and a warning in ministry. And remember, Paul is now addressing these pastors in the Ephesus region, these leaders in the Ephesus region, uh, for the final time. Paul is uh, finishing his third missionary journey. He's been traveling around Macedonia and coming over from Greece and traveling back toward Jerusalem where he's trying to get there for the day of Pentecost, if you remember. And so Paul has, had, had spent three years in Ephesus, had departed for a while, had made this big loop, and now was coming back around after his time there, realizing this will be the last opportunity that I had to share with the leaders there in Ephesus and all the home churches that were there. And we talked about this last time. Imagine what that would feel like. What if you knew this was your last chance to share with someone before you died or before you ever, or at least knowing you never would have another chance to speak to them? So all these things are rushing through Paul's heart. All these things are rushing through Paul's mind. And as we read this, there's such a passion of Paul's heart coming out and pouring out on these young pastors. Again, I think about a pastor's conference, and I've been to a lot of pastor's conferences over the years. And I'd love to be at a pastor's conference with Paul being the main speaker. But again, it's interesting when you, know, you go to pastor's conferences today, which I'm sure this was very different, and there's, a, there's very interesting crowds that are there. Sometimes there's, most of us are there just to hear and to hear from the wisdom from those that, are, that God has used and raised up and going to speak to us at the conference. Sometimes there's those sitting out in the audience that are judging the pastors going, hey, I could have taught better than that. I didn't like his points. I, I could have done better at this illustration. Paul didn't care about any of that. This was not some kind of competitive pastor's conference. Who gets to speak? How come this guy didn't speak? Which sometimes happens at conferences. This was, I love you guys. This is my last chance to talk to you. I don't care about how, you know, the points that I make or if it's very eloquent or that none of that matters. I want you to hear the heart of God. And I want you to learn from my example that I've given you over three years and pour that out for you. I want to give you warnings. Again, remember we talked about it. It's not just the example that Paul gave them, but he said, you as the overseers, you're watching the flock, uh, watching the flock rather. You need to be warned about what to watch for. And of course, he's going to address the whole wolf and non-wolf issue that we talked about last week. But it was much more than that. It's anything that the flock needs to be warned about. It's anything they need to be encouraged on. And so that is really the job of the pastors that have gone ahead for, for others. And this is Paul's heart. 
If you remember, as we ended last week, he's right in the middle of this, the farewell address here, as we talked about. And Paul, again, I gave a run and go about what he talked about as far as, the, he, he said he spent day and night for three years warning them about the wolves that would come from without and the glory seekers that would ride up from with, uh, rise up from within to divide the flock. And so, and, but notice this, I, I wanted to give that a run and go because I didn't get to address it fully last week as we ran out of time. Uh, but notice he says, I warned you about these things, but I warned you with tears. And I have to underline in my Bible. It means a lot more to me now as a 30-some year pastor as it did when, when we first went out to start the ministry. Because I understand Paul's heart a little bit better. What Paul was saying was, look, there's gonna be wolves from without, there's gonna be those from within that cause problems, and there's gonna be casualties that come to the body of Christ because of it. And the reason that he was having tears was, even though he was warning them and preparing them, what Paul realized is what I have learned over the years is that, that when this takes place, and every church deals with it from time to time, it almost always comes with casualties of war. Again, what do I mean by that? Listen, whether or not it's the church's fault, whether or not it's somebody in the body's fault, the fault doesn't really matter when it comes to the casualties. You know, when you go to war and you're going out with people to battle, they have what's called friendly fire. And sometimes you see people that are knocked down by the enemy. Sometimes you see people that are knocked down by friendly fire. Either way, it is tragic. And when somebody is down, when there's a fellow brother or sister that's down, whether it's friendly fire or whether it's enemy fire, our job is to try to go and restore them and bandage up those wounds. The hard thing about when there are divisions that happen in churches where wolves get in or people rise up wanting to play politics or power or whatever, the bottom line is that when there's divisions and people get upset and they leave and those kind of things happen, there's nobody that can minister to them once that takes place. In other words, what happens if someone from the church leaves, if you're, if you're plugged into any church and you get upset with whatever the case might be and you and a group of people leave, the problem is you don't have anybody out there to comfort you. You have a bunch of wounded people on the battlefield and a bunch of wounded people are not good at helping each other with their wounds. And since there's not another church that's involved, nobody can come in to minister. And what I've seen, that if a host church tries to reach out to people that have been wounded, it's get away from me, you're the one that did it. So they can't get ministry from the church they were in. They can't get ministry from a church without because they don't have one now. And you have a bunch of injured Christians laying all over the battlefield with blood and wounds and nobody there to help them. It's tragic. And this is why Paul is saying with tears. I shared with you last week, sometimes as a pastor, I'll see these things happen. And the sad thing to me is not so much that somebody left, although that's sad. The worst part is they don't go anywhere. And if you've got a pastor's heart, and you care about people, whether or not you agree with what happened or didn't happen, your heart is broken because you realize, who's going to minister to them? What's going to happen? Are they just going to walk away from the church? There's some of you right now that are here because you feel you got hurt somewhere else. You don't feel you got hurt, you did. Whether or not it was legitimate, non-legitimate, I can't judge that. And praise God that you're here. Praise God that God has restored you and brought you back into fellowship. And my prayer would be the same for anyone, even that left here, if they ever did upset, that they would find another church. That's the number one thing. Get plugged in somewhere so that you don't just lay out there bleeding out and wounded. Because let me tell you, Satan is looking for sheep that are limping and sheep that are on their own. And sheep that are limping and on their own, they're oftentimes completely devoured by the enemy. Look, even if they're right. Well, I was right. Okay, maybe you were, but you're still gonna be devoured until you get it right with your home church or until you get plugged in somewhere. You need to get right with all the brothers and sisters you need to get it right with, but the bottom line is you need to be somewhere taking care of business and getting it right. And so in fellowship, I, I um, had someone share with me after last service about a situation where they felt they were hurt and they were out of fellowship for years and they're so glad that God's bringing them back. Guys, note this. God intends for his flock to gather together. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching online or listening by radio and maybe you don't go to church because your church hurt you and whatever the case might be, you need to find a fellowship to get involved in. You need to be somewhere. And I would even extend this message to those that are saying, well, I don't want to go to church because it's too crowded or I don't go to church because of whatever the reason. Look, find a place you can be involved in a fellowship because God designed that the church come together. You say, well, what about in Ephesus? Didn't they have home churches? Yes, they did in the early church have home churches only because it wasn't legal to gather in a public gathering yet. They would get in trouble if they gathered in a public gathering. Once they finally were able to gather in public, they started gathering in larger gatherings. And, and I think home fellowships are great. There's not a problem. That's why we have kinships. But there's much more ministry that goes on in a gathering. The Holy Spirit is here to work in your hearts. 
The Holy Spirit is here to do ministry, to make connections. And, and again, remember, the Bible says this, do not forsake the assembling together of believers. Note this, Christians, especially as you see the day approaching. What is the day? It's the day of the Lord's return. Does anybody see some signs that Jesus may be coming back soon? So what God is saying, the closer you get to the return of Jesus, you need to be in church more, not less. Now, I'm thankful that we have the internet so people that are sick or can't come can watch and radio, et cetera, but that's not sufficient. You need to find a place you can be there in person. And again, I know that things can be uh, difficult sometimes, especially for those who have legitimate physical uh, you know, handicaps or whatever. I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying in general as the body of Christ, and I want to say this as well. Look, like this last thing that came through with everybody getting you know, the virus and all that went with that. There's going to be more of that. Jesus said in the last days, there's going to be an increase in plagues. That means as, he, as we get close to his return, there's going to be more of these type of events that take place. Now, guys, note this. This is so important for the church. If Jesus told us there's going to be more of these virus type or sick type events, the closer he gets to his return, and at the same time, he said, when you see my return getting close, don't forsake the fellowship together of believers, what was he saying? He's saying, even when you see those things come through, don't stop going to church. You need to continue to stay in fellowship. He told us it was going to happen, and he said, I want you to continue to gather. That doesn't mean we're foolish. It doesn't mean we don't use wisdom and general hygiene, and we'll address every issue as those issues come up. But we need to make sure that we're obedient to the word of God, not to forsake the assembling, especially as we see the day approaching. And remember what Jesus said, when you see a day approaching, there's going to be more sickness. So it's kind of this whole thing. Do you trust me? Where's your faith? Are you going to follow through? And I think it's a purifying of the church that takes place. It is taking place. And I think it's a test of our faith. Again, I'm not talking about uh, being dangerous, being foolish. Uh, obviously, if there's something that comes through that's a, some great concern, we're going to take caution. We're going to look at it. We're not going to put the body in danger. But when things settle down, that's where we have to realize, okay, God, what do you want us to do? And how do we move forward in this? Because again, what Satan's desire is to do is to scatter the flock and not let them meet. His desire is to shut church down, which we saw happen in many areas of the country. That was not the Lord. That was the enemy. And so we need to be ready because there's going to be more of those coming down the road. And so Paul here is weeping in tears because this, he says, you know, look, I can't stop all the casualties that are going to take place because of a wolf coming in or someone else, you know, uh, uh, within the body even raising up for whatever the reasons. And that's exactly true. You can't stop it from happening, but you weep because you know the outcome of what's going to happen and the damage that it's going to bring. And, and so, again, it's interesting when you see these kind of things take place, by the time that uh, someone, uh, the shepherds figure it out and begin to deal with it, oftentimes it becomes uh, a situation where more people are even affected. But again, that's why Paul said he weeps over this because he sees the damage that it does to the body of Christ. I remember uh, the last conference I went to with Pastor Chuck before he died, 2013, and I remember you know, thinking this will probably be the last conference, and it was. He had lung cancer. We all knew that he had lung cancer. And it was the same kind of heart that Paul had here, maybe not as dramatic because of where Paul was about to leave, knowing he would never see them. And Chuck didn't know whether he would, how much longer he would be there. We didn't know for sure either. But it was interesting. One of the other pastors was sharing that when the main leaders got together behind closed doors with Pastor Chuck, one of them asked him and said, hey, what is your big concern for Calvary Chapel as you go into heaven? You know, you've got lung cancer. You're going to be moving into the kingdom. What is your big concern? And they said that he began to, the tears began to run down his face. And he, he made reference to what Paul said here. He said, I know that when I'm gone, wolves are going to come in and they're going to scatter the flock. See, what Paul understood and what Pastor Chuck understood is as soon as the leader is gone, the enemy looks for any opportunity to destroy and to divide the best that he can. And throughout church history, Whenever a leader of a movement has died, you'll, you'll immediately see kind of the enemy coming in and trying to divide the movement and pull things in a different direction. And even as Chuck cried about, even as Chuck warned about, we're seeing a little bit of that in Calvary Chapel. Now, thankfully, the majority of Calvary Chapel is holding together, and I praise God for that. But you already start to see some guys that are rising up, and they're heading in different directions, and I believe because, as Paul said, they're wanting people to follow them rather than Christ. And so you're going to see that in every movement. By the way, I'm not worried about this generation of Calvary Chapel. I'm worried about the next one. The next generation is the one I worry about. This generation, I think, is going to be fine holding to the word of God. But I have real concerns as a medium-aged pastor. You may say old, uh, but I've seen guys a lot older than me, okay? You can always find somebody older. Um, makes me young. But either way, as a medium-aged to older pastor, I have concerns about where I see things going because I, I know that historically in the church, once it heads that way, you begin to see kind of this drift, 
but we're going to be true to hold to the word of God. This generation, and we're going to do that here, we're going to hold true to the word of God. We need to be praying for the next generation that that doesn't happen. But that is one of the reasons, you know, again, we are Calvary Chapel. But again, you've probably noticed we go by Calvary Knoxville, and the sign up front says Calvary Knoxville. That was a planned event. And I wish I could say I came up with it on my own, but I actually uh, heard a warning of another pastor talking about this. He said, you know, and and I I said, this is wisdom. When Pastor Chuck dies and the movement does begin to veer another direction, which happens with every movement when its leader dies at some point, he said, I'm going to go ahead and have a different name so we don't have to change the name. How great. If Calvary Chapel veers off, then we're still Calvary Knoxville, and we don't have to change our name or or buy a new sign. So it wasn't just because I'm... I'm being silly, tongue-in-cheek. It wasn't just so we have to buy a new sign. My, heart, my greatest grief would be that Calvary would, would go a different direction. But at the same time, knowing what Paul is saying here, that's why this planning was done. There is no movement that stays on target completely. That's why when you see movements raised up, you'll see them veer away after a while when the leader dies, and you'll see God raise up a brand new movement. In Jesus' day, it was no different. The Sadducees and Pharisees, you had the, the Jewish denomination, the Jewish non-denomination, The Jewish religion, whatever title you want to give it, the Sadducees and Pharisees had become cold and stale and dead. And Jesus did not go into the middle of it and try to rescue it. He went there and warned them and rebuked them. But he went outside of the camp and he started something brand new. And that's historically what God does. When a movement veers off, God goes outside of it. God starts something brand new. And God went up to Galilee and got some fishermen and started a whole brand new movement of the Lord. Again, which we now know as the church. God does it. He'll continue to do it. Uh, But at the same time, I understand Paul's heart here when he says, I warned you day and night with tears because as much as you try to prevent these kind of divisions, these kind of hurts, these type of things, it is not going to be prevented. Not until Jesus comes back. And when the true shepherd comes back, who will never do anything wrong, we're all going to be able to righteously serve him and follow him in peace and harmony for a thousand years and then on into a new heaven and a new earth. And so that's that's coming to a, a universe near you. But for now, we have to deal with where we are now. And we have to do the best that we can now. And so, again, anybody in listening, probably, if you're here, you're you're not going through a situation where you can't go to church anymore. But if there's anybody that God has listening online or by radio or whatever, you're saying, well, I just can't go to church anymore because I was too hurt. I want you to know this. The Lord knows that you were hurt. The Lord knows that it was real. The Lord knows you need to be healed. But the Lord also says, I want you to be in fellowship because that's where the healing, the true healing is going to take place. And that's where you're going to be guarded against the attack of the enemy. Again, a uh, limping sheep is, 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 is easy to pick off. And so Paul goes on. Notice he says in verse 32, because of this is of, of in tears and knowing what's going to happen, that's the setting. He says, so now, brethren, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace. Guys, I want to pause in the middle of a sentence there. Of course, Paul has long sentences anyway. But he says, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Listen to what Paul's saying. Because I know that the enemy is going to divide the flock in different ways. And you're going to be attacked from without and within as the enemy tries to move. I know that's going to happen. And I know I'm not going to see you. I can't be here to defend you. I can't get out the shepherd's staff and go, boom, get away from my sheep. You're right. I can't do that. He said, I commend you to God. Isn't that beautiful? God is able to protect you. God is able to hold you. God is able to keep you on track. I commend you to God. And notice this, not just commending them to God to be God able to keep his flock and God. The Bible says the Lord is able to keep us. And he is, even when we're hurt, even when things go wrong, he's able to keep his flock. He said, but and the word of grace. That is, if you want to maintain your walk with the Lord in the midst of this battlefield called spiritual warfare that we all live through, We have to not only commend our life to God and say, God, you need to hold me and keep me in place. We need to say, I need to be in the word of God and trusting in the word of grace every day or I'm not going to make it. This is the key to the strong Christian and the one that doesn't make it. Those who are in the word every day, staying true to the word, when those trials come, they're going to be fine. What did Jesus say? He said, if you build your house on the sand, when the winds blow and the storms come, what happens? It collapses. And sand basically is, there's no time in the word. There's no time in prayer. There's no foundation to hold your life in place as a Christian. And boom, there it goes, swept out to sea. He said, however, if you build on the rock, Jesus Christ is the rock. He said, not if the storms come. He said, when they do. When the storm and the waves, when they beat against that house, you will remain standing. Why? Because you're founded on the rock. Now, you're going to feel it. 
I've been through trials and things over the years where I feel beat up. I feel like I've been through a hurricane, just, you know, beat up, uh, whatever. I, I remember uh, kind of joking with Tracy. I said, when we started the ministry, it's like I, I kind of knew that it'd be kind of a great start, you know, and you kind of jump out there, you know, you, you kind of get, God's really going to shoot us out there, and here we go. But I never thought it'd be like those cannons in the circus that shoots you out, you know, and, and you end up landing in a bunch of cactus, <laughs> because that's kind of what happens. But God is faithful because we had built the foundation on Jesus, then God is able not only to keep you where you need to be, but to grow you through those things. Build your house on the rock. He said, I commend you to God. I commend you to the word of grace because God's word is what's going to keep you in place and keep you strong. And notice he says, look what it's going to do. Two things it does. It is able to build you up. Number one, that is the word of God builds you up. The foundation is Jesus, but you're built up as you spend time, daily time in the word and in prayer, growing in the Lord, getting stronger. But secondly, look at this, and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That is all the believers. So it doesn't just build you up, but you get an inheritance by investing in it. You get a reward by investing in it. I mentioned last week, some people seem to have a problem in saying, you know, what, you shouldn't be wanting reward in heaven. The Bible teaches that as a motivation. Reward in heaven. Inheritance that's laid before you. There's nothing wrong in that. Now, we shouldn't be just living for what we can get. I understand there can be a wrong heart there. But there's nothing wrong in saying, look, I'm going to invest in the things of the kingdom because there's an inheritance waiting on me. And he says, if you do this, you're not only going to be built up, but you're also not going to have this inheritance that's in heaven. Now look at verse 33. He says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided my own necessities. And for those who were with me, I've not, uh, have I shown you in, in every way, uh, by, or I have shown you in every way by laboring like this. And he shows the hard work he was doing out in the field that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And again, Paul reminds them, he conducted himself in the proper way when it came to finances in the ministry. And that is, Paul says, I didn't come for your money. You know, when I came there to Ephesus, I didn't ask for money. I wasn't seeking money from you guys. I wanted your heart. I wanted you to know God. And I poured my life out. Not only did I not ask, I gave. And that should be the heart of all of us, not just those in leadership, but that should be the heart of every believer. And that is that Paul makes it clear, look, I didn't come after your finances. I didn't come after your money. I didn't want any of that. I came after your heart. And so I'm not asking for that. And again, this is why I think we have to be so careful uh, when it comes to ministry. Um, and again, one of the reasons that we rarely mention money here at Calvary Chapel. Now, let me say this. There is nothing wrong in taking up an offering. I know we don't do it here at Calvary. But there's nothing wrong in that. That is biblical. Moses did it. It is a good thing to take up an offering. So if churches are taking up offerings, praise the Lord. That's a good thing. Why don't we do it here? Simply because, again, I grew up in a generation where people were saying, all the church wants is your money. And I wanted to pull that, out, that rug out from under them. Nobody can walk in and say, all you guys want is our money because we don't ask for it. Uh, and at the same time, what we do is, is, look, we teach the word of God and we minister to your hearts. And here's the thing I've learned. If you minister to people's hearts and teach them the word of God, they know what to do and they do the right thing. And now you can see what we've done for the last 27 years. We've never taken up an offering. And look at how, God, how faithful God has been. Because when you minister to hearts and teach, you know what to do. You're going to do the right thing. And I'll tell you something else when it comes to, when it comes about finances or money and, and this kind of thing. If you just teach through the Bible, God talks about it. As much as God talks about it is about as much as we should talk about it. And that's true with about every subject. If you go through the Bible, God will talk about every subject. And as much as God talks about it, that's about how much you should talk about it. Like I said, if people understand their walk with God and their responsibilities and they're going to be obedient to the Lord, they're going to do the right thing. And we've seen that here now for 27 years uh, at Calvary Chapel. I did have something happen for the first time that's never happened before, uh, kind of a new thing for me. And they didn't say it to me, but they told someone else, uh, and which related to me. They said, a family left the church because you don't ask for money enough. <laughs> that was a new one. I've never had that happen. And, um, but either way, and I, you know, if that's their conviction, they need to follow their conviction. But again, the thing is, it's not that we don't teach about it. If you guys were here going through the Bible, we recently went through Malachi and it talks about tithing and, and giving to God. So we cover it when God does. And again, I, like I said, I know that's something that's there, but I, again, I believe that God's people know what it is they're supposed to do when they're taught the word of God. And Paul says, look, I didn't come here for your money. I didn't come to do any of that. I came here because I love you. And I came here because I was going to give to you. As a matter of fact, he goes on and says, look, I not only did I not take from you guys, he said, but I worked and met my own needs. Look at this. Paul made sure that he worked to take care of his own needs, and not just his own needs, but for those who traveled with him. Think about this. 
He was a missionary that went out and, and paid for his own way on the mission field. He was his monthly check. Now, is it wrong for missionaries to raise funds? No. Is it wrong for us to support missionaries? No. I think that's good. If we can support missionaries and that frees them up to go do ministry and what they're called to do, praise the Lord for that. But here's the real question, and I think where Paul nails it here, would they still go if they didn't raise that support? Would they still go out and trust God in faith if they just said, you know, God, I, you've told me to do this, I'm gonna do it. You know, it's interesting, um, early on in Calvary Chapel, and it's kind of a saying we all still say today, uh, where God guides, God provides. That's something Chuck used to always tell us, and it's true. And um, it's, it's interesting now with the Calvary Chapels, the way they do it today, things have changed. Um, they'll, they'll put together a team some, in some cases, not always, but they'll put together a team, they'll send a, a worship leader, they'll send some money with them, they'll help them get in their first place, and there they'll plant a church. Look, I have no problem, praise the Lord for that, but I'm like, I'm, what? You're doing that? The, back with the old Calvary guys, back when, you know, this kind of thing, the way Calvary did it was, is no, they didn't give you a penny. You went out, and if, God got, if God's guiding, God's providing, and if it doesn't work, that means God doesn't want it to, and you shouldn't be doing it anyway. Because God knows who he wants to be doing it and who he doesn't, so God's not going to supply for it. But if God's in it, it'll go, and God's blessing will be there, and now you know that it's the Lord that's doing it, and you see the work of God in faith. And that's what, we, when Tracy and I went out again and planted the church, there wasn't anybody helping us. Now, I will say this. Uh, we did have one guy that was faithful. We didn't ask for anything, but some guy sent these small checks you know, every month for, uh, for the time, the, well, the two to three years that I was working while the church was being established. And it was so neat because as soon as the church began to be able to give us a, a little bit of money, that stopped. And he didn't know that. He had no idea. And again, we never asked him for it, but that was so cool. But the bottom line was, is that we knew that God had called us and we came out and we worked and labored and said, we're just going to go do it and trust in God. If it's not God, it won't happen. We'll go a different direction. If it is God, God's going to supply. And we saw that God was faithful. And there's such a deep lesson of faith in that. There's such a power in watching God be true to, to, to make, you know, make everything work out of nothing. I mean, those kind of situations. I think it stretches our faith. What did Jesus say? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. That's a word for some of you this morning. You're worried about your finances right now. You're worried about your bills and legitimately so. But here's what he said. Here is a guarantee from the word of God you can take home with you today. If you seek him first, that doesn't mean just read your Bible occasionally or go to church every so often. No, you've got to sit and say, now, am I really seeking God first every day? Because if you meet that category, his word is on the line. It cannot fail. He said, if you put me first, you seek first the kingdom. He said, you will have all these things met. It can't fail. It's impossible because that means God's word would fail. And I've seen that true. That was a great lesson for me to learn in ministry as we went out and did this. And I had a young pastor call me a while back. And uh, here I said I wasn't old and I said a young pastor. But anyway, um, not that old, middle, anyway. But um, you know, I'm halfway at 122. It's not that bad. Um, but he called me up and he said, so what do you do? He said, he said I'm, I'm really struggling now. Uh, I'm having to work to pay the bills, but also trying to get the church planted. You know, uh, you know what, what is your advice on that? You know, having to work and, and still be a pastor. I said, well, here's what I'm going to tell you. You're going to have to work and still be a pastor. <laughs> it's that simple. There's nothing more complicated. Said, yes, would you have more time if you were freed up to do it? Sure. But if God has called you to work and to pastor, then you work and you pastor. And that's what Paul was telling him. Paul said, look, I gave you an example. I'm out here doing it, but I'm working to meet my needs, and I'm doing what God called me to do. Pastors of Ephesus, you need to do the same thing. You need to be working and doing what God's called you to do. And if God blesses you with a fellowship that grows and they're able to support you, then praise the Lord. Now you can focus full time on the ministry and do a lot of other things. But you can only do what you can do in the meantime. And so I see so much wisdom here from, a, from, the, from, this, from Pastor Paul as he's reaching out to these younger pastors and teaching them. And again, notice he finishes it by saying it is, it is where Jesus said himself, it's more blessed to give than receive. Did you know we don't find that anywhere in the Bible, but here? You don't find that in the Gospels. So where did Paul get this? Where either God told Paul directly, the Lord told him in, in, in some of his dreams and visions, or else it was word of mouth from some of those that were around the Lord and wasn't recorded. Remember, at the end of the book of John, it says that there were so many things the Lord said that if they tried to write everything down, it, it would have filled the, filled the books of the earth. Matter of fact, he said that all the books of the earth couldn't contain 
everything that the Lord did and said. So this is probably one of those phrases that snuck through that nobody ever put down in the word of God of what Jesus said, but we know he said it because Paul verified that he said it. And what a beautiful truth that is. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And again, the reason is obvious. Number one, you're dying to self and helping others, but also there's an eternal reward for this. Whenever you give, there's an eternal reward. What did the Lord say? He said, even a cup of water to a prophet, there's gonna be a reward for that. So when we invest in the kingdom and invest in the things of God, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so Paul gives them that. He finishes up this wonderful exhortation about being an example and how they need to be watching and warning the body of Christ there in Ephesus. And then he says, it says in verse 36, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And I just love this humility of Paul. You know, he wasn't this great pastor that was too important to kneel down with the people and pray. He kneels down. He shows his humility. He shows his vulnerability, which he'd already done by tears, that he cried with them. And I think that's another important thing when it comes to ministry is not to think you're high and mighty or you're, you're greater than you're supposed to be, especially as the ministry grows. You know, the, the dangerous thing for ministry is not when it's, there's other dangers when it's small, but I think the dangerous thing for a ministry when it starts to grow and take off and you see great results and great fruit, there's a danger in that because some can start to believe it has something to do with them rather than understanding, no, this is the Lord and I'm just watching. I've watched what happened the last couple of years here and it's exciting, but I truly feel like a spectator. I, I do. No, not, we're not doing anything different than we've done since we got here, but look what God's doing. Why? I'm just watching God work. It, there's this, there are hard seasons where it feels like you're plowing concrete just to get the seed in the ground. And then there are seasons, seasons where you're just riding the wave. You're just kind of watching this thing. Going, well, this is pretty cool what God's doing. And the problem is, is some people begin to think that, you know, they have something to do with it. Paul was not like that. Paul was, he was vulnerable in front of them. He wept in front of them. He knelt down in front of them. He realized, look, I'm just one of you guys. I'm, yes, I'm called to be this, to, to lead you guys. But it doesn't mean that somehow I'm, I'm more special. And I love that about Paul. What a great example his life was to pastors and any of us that want to be in leadership. In verse 37, he says, then they all wept freely and they fell on Paul's neck and they kissed him. So they loved him dearly after all the time they spent together. And again, you can, you can imagine the heart of, the, of just the life that Paul had poured into them. And it says, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. And so again, uh, they, they realized we're not going to see you anymore, Paul. Uh, again, the spirit had told Paul he was going into all these trials and tribulations. And as we get further here into Acts, we're going to see what those were. He gets arrested there in Jerusalem. He spends years in and out of uh, a prison, then travels to Rome and gets free for a while, then gets back in prison, eventually Nero putting him to death. So we'll get to all that as we work on through the book of, of Acts. But again, you can see their hearts and, and this love that was shared from the investment, this mutual investment of them loving each other, iron sharpening iron, and growing in the things of the Lord. As Paul was that example, as Paul showed them that he, he had nothing they could accuse him of that was wrong. He desired no one's money, if you will. And then also the warning that he gave, these, these major lessons that we learned as Paul was dealing with the pastors there um, in Ephesus. And again, my heart as we finish this portion of scripture is that God would do the same thing in us that we would have a desire to live as examples for Christ. That sounds intimidating. When I say live as an example for Christ, it's, well, I'm not perfect. I can't live like Jesus. Nobody can. But we can still be an example for where we are. So where you are in your maturity, where you are in your faith, be an example. Live for Christ the best you can by the power of the Holy Spirit. Warts and all, you're gonna make mistakes. You're not gonna be perfect. No one expects that. But do that. Try to be above accusation, or as the Bible says, above reproach. Paul said, I, there's nothing you can accuse me of. I didn't ask for your apparel, your money, your things. We should be living a life that, again, is non-accusable. And if we see in areas where we are accusable, we need to repent and ask God to forgive us. And then we need to love each other enough to be living in such a way that we warn each other of any pitfalls that we might see. As Paul said, hey, I've come to live in front of you and also to warn you and also to live a life that is not accusable before you. What a great um, goal to have as a believer. But again, how is this done? It's only done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to pray and ask for God to do these things in us that he was praying what happened and, and teaching what happened to these teachers there in Ephesus but, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, God would come upon us now and God would do this in our lives. And so let's pray right now and ask God to do that as we finish up here today. Father, I wanna thank you, Lord, for your word. And again, how you use Paul to minister to those church leaders and early leaders there in Ephesus and how you're still using it today, right now with us and anyone else that's teaching this portion of scripture around the world. God, how powerful that is. I thank you, Lord, for these lessons. God, we wanna be those that can be an example to others 
trying to follow you and, and following you, God, by being in your word and in prayer and being built up in the word of God. We want to be those that are non-accusable, that are above reproach. I know the enemy will still accuse. We will be accused. For we know that we have the accuser of the brethren who's fighting against us on a regular basis. But Lord, I pray that those accusations after investigation would fall to the ground. And if there's something we need to do, that we'd make it right. But also, we also would have an eye to warn those around us, not just as leaders of the church, but even other brothers and sisters that may be heading down a wrong path. Lord, not in some type of wrongful judging of them, but in warning them of the pitfalls that lie ahead if they continue on down this path. And if there's anyone here this morning going down a path that's the wrong direction, I pray your spirit right now would pierce their heart and give them that warning to come back. Get back with the flock. Don't be out there on your own. You're a sitting duck. You're, you're the one the wolf is gonna see first because you're all alone. And so, Father, I thank you again for the work you've done this morning by the teaching of your word. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. And we ask it in Jesus' name.